When many people imagine the Franciscans, I suspect that they think of a jovial character that fits better in a cartoon and cookie jar than in real people. We do have a history of being portrayed as simple drunkards. And while it's great that we're seen as well-liked and approachable, a major part of who we are is often forgotten. Our intellectual tradition. What have Franciscans contributed to the church in terms of theology? And what makes us different from other schools? This is Catholicism in Focus. When speaking about the Franciscan intellectual tradition, it's important to state from the outset that there is no such thing as a singular or overarching theology that we all hold. Please, get friars to all agree on something? Never gonna happen. Unlike the Dominicans, who very clearly look to one theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, the Franciscans have a wide variety of theologians who have offered important contributions to the Church. From the old Franciscan school of St. Bonaventure, Alexander of Hales, and St. Angela Foligno, to the later school of Blessed John Duns Scotus and William of Ockham, to the many modern thinkers within the tradition, Franciscans have always taken pride in the diversity of our intellectual tradition. Because of this, there is hardly a universal handbook when it comes to being a Franciscan theologian, but there are some topics that grab our attention more than others, and some distinctly Franciscan theological contributions to church theology. A primary example of this is the absolute freedom of God's will. In the medieval world, there was often a debate over the most primary aspect of God, intellect or will. For intellectuals, people like St. Thomas Aquinas or Meister Eckhart, what mattered most was the intellect or reason of God. God was perfect because God's reason, that which is oriented towards the good, is perfect. For them, this perfect intellect orients the will to make good choices, making God's will perfect, yet determined. Franciscans like John Duns Scotus and William of Ockham took offense at this. If God's will is determined, then can God truly be free? As voluntarists, they believed that the intellect was but one factor in determining the will, and ultimately separate from it, asserting that it was God's indeterminate and completely free will that actually made something good or bad. In layman's terms, Aquinas suggests that something is good in itself, irrespective of God, whereas Scotus and other Franciscans argued that something is good because God makes it good by choosing it. It's why, when asked if God could break the Ten Commandments or dispense us from following them, Aquinas says no, while Scotus and Occam say yes to different degrees. For them, the only reason that the Ten Commandments are good is because God chooses them. Another key topic for many Franciscans is the absolute primacy of Christ as the purpose for the Incarnation. I've discussed this topic a few times already on this channel, but the basic idea rests on a question. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, would Jesus have still been incarnate as a human being? For Thomas, the answer is no. The primary purpose of the Incarnation is redemption, and so without the need for redemption, there is no need for the Incarnation. Sad. For Franciscans, the answer is undoubtedly yes. While the Incarnation did bring about redemption, it more primarily brought about the self-revelation of God. God is the fountain of overflowing fecundity, according to St. Bonaventure, and is naturally oriented towards sharing God's self. Building off of this, Scotus then argues that the purpose of creation in the first place, even before sin, was to have something to share with. We were created to be in Christ's image, not Him in ours. For this reason, Franciscan theology tends to emphasize the importance of Christmas over Easter. While, yes, the death and resurrection of Christ were undoubtedly important, it was God's incarnation, coming to be like us in all things but sin, that actually marked the start of our salvation. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, our salvation was henceforth inevitable. Of course, the Incarnation extends far beyond just the person of Jesus for Franciscans, as we can see all the way back in St. Francis himself, an incarnational worldview towards all creation. God's image and creative goodness can be known through all that is made. I can hardly think of a spirituality with a more positive outlook on creation than the Franciscans. More than just nature enthusiasts or tree huggers, there is an acute sense in our theology that the immaterial, eternal God can and has become present in the material, finite world. The trees and the earth, water and air, every atom and molecule in existence is infused with the goodness of God's creative power and holds the potential of God's presence. Thus, through the study of the outside world, Franciscans believe that we can know God's will, which again is primary to who God is. And what is that will, you ask? Well, love, of course. 
It's the love that seeks to share, the love that came in the humility of the cross, the love that redeems and lifts up even the worst of sinners. It is an efficacious love that seeks to grow and be in communion with others. Taken together, many Franciscans of late have begun to reclaim the Eastern notion of theosis or divinization, the idea that God came to be like us so that we could become like God. In our redemption, we not simply return to the state of the Garden of Eden, but are in fact assumed into the very inner life of God, purified and made a part of God. Amazing stuff, right? What's crazier is that we tend to extend this beyond just the human person to all of creation. Because the purpose of the incarnation was not limited to redemption, but meant for sharing love, and since God's creative power is witnessed in all of creation, the idea of theosis then applies to everything in existence. God seeks to share God's self with everything and to bring everything into the inner life of God. So yeah, for some Franciscans, all dogs do go to heaven, as well as all trees, stars, pieces of metal, and everything else God created. And while this might seem extremely overwhelming and transcendent in scope, dealing with the whole cosmos, the fact of the matter is that Franciscan theology tends to be extremely personal as well. Our God is an imminent God, closer to us than we are to ourselves. Metaphysically speaking, this means an emphasis on the individual, whereas Aquinas would suggest that our essential identity finds its foundation in our common nature, and that what makes us different from one another is found in the accidents of who we are, Scotus believed that our essential identity was actually found in our differences. In other words, people like Scotus emphasize the individuality of every being rather than just the species, that we are more than just sharers in a common nature, but actually created to be particular beings. Together with the insistence on the importance of all creation, Franciscans, led by St. Francis himself, have tended to have a much more experiential focus on theological reflection. Rather than identifying universal principles that apply to all situations and all people, Truth is found in the particular, in the heart of an individual's prayer, in what one can see and smell and touch. Faith is not just an intellectual exercise for its own sake, but something that is embodied and meant to be acted upon. Whereas Dominicans may be dispensed from certain prayers for the sake of study, as study for them is a form of prayer, and Jesuits have been universally dispensed from all communal prayer for the sake of mission, St. Francis made it abundantly clear to his brothers Study is only allowed if it does not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion. Prayer, personal encounter, physical labor, living and experiencing the world. These are the modes of theological reflection for Franciscans. While sitting in a classroom and reading books is important, it will always be incomplete if it's detached from an experience of the living and true God in our midst. This, inevitably, means that there will never be an overarching school for Franciscans. With such an emphasis on the personal and experiential, nothing, even the general principles I've listed in this video, will ever be true for every Franciscan. Bonaventure and Angela and Scotus all had slightly different methods and probably disagreed on a number of issues. But that's okay. In fact, I can't imagine it any other way. Unlike other theological traditions that are based on a clearly marked rule with a distinct personality, the rule in life of the Friars Minor is simple we are called to live the gospel. What unites us is not a single theologian, methodological lens, philosophical foundation, or end goal, but rather our shared desire to experience, reflect upon, and live as Christ did. If that is your starting point as well, you might just be a Franciscan yourself. <laughs>